Hi everyone, I had a request for some more game theory videos so I thought in this video I'm just going to have a look at this simultaneous move game here. What I'm going to do is just solve the game first, so I'll find any Nash equilibrium. Then I'm going to just go ahead and think about how this game will look if we allowed one player to move first. So I'll turn it into what we call an extensive form of the game. I'll then solve for what we call subgame perfect equilibrium. And when we do that, we're going to see what we call a first mover advantage. So looking closely at this game, we get to do a few things. I thought it'd be a nice exercise. I should also say that I have other videos about the theory, about how to find Nash equilibrium, etc. So I'll link to those videos in the description below if you need them. I won't spend a lot of time explaining that stuff here just because I've, I've already got other videos that address that. Right, so in this game, I had the idea of an interaction between two builders who could either build a small house or build a large house. If they both build the same type of house, then they're in direct competition with one another. So they would have to lower their prices. And so the payoffs are kind of lowest in these cases. So if builder one builds a small house and builder two builds a small house, they both get a five payoff. And this is the same outcome as if both built a large house. They also would both get a five payoff if they both do that. Then I had this thought, well, if they're doing kind of different things, they're not in direct competition with one another, so they can get a higher payoff. Uh, so if Builder 1 builds a large house and Builder 2 builds a small house, Builder 1 would get 20 and Builder 2 would get 10. If Builder 1 builds a small house and Builder 2 builds a large house, Builder 1 gets 10 and Builder 2 gets 20. Now, hopefully you can see that in these cases, it's, it's better to be the builder who's building the large house uh, if the other builder is building a small house. All right, what I'm going to do is just go ahead and solve for the Nash equilibrium in this game. To do that, we're just going to find our best responses. So I'm just going to start by thinking, if I'm builder number one and if builder number two builds a small house, what would be my best response? Well, we would be in this kind of column here. Builder one could build a small house and get five or build a large house and get 20. 20 is bigger than five. So building a large house is the best response uh, for builder one of builder two building a small house. So I'm just going to underline there just to, to mark that off. If builder two builds a large house, we're in this column here. Builder one could build a small house and get 10 or a large house and get five. 10 is bigger than five. So building a small house is the best response to builder two building a large house. So that's Builder 1's best responses. If we think about Builder 2's best responses, well, if Builder 1 builds a small house, we're on this row here, Builder 2 could build a small house and get 5, or a large house and get 20. 20 is bigger than 5, so Builder 2 should build large to Builder 1's building small. If Builder 1 builds a large house, Builder 2 could build a small house and get 10, or a large house and get 5. 10 is bigger than 5. So Builder 2's best response here is to build a, a small house. So that's it, that's our best responses. And what hopefully you can see is that we actually have two Nash equilibria here. Those are with Builder 1 building large and Builder 2 building small, and Builder 1 building small and Builder 2 building large. And just to give a quick interpretation of what's going on here, I suppose as a game, it's kind of interesting. It tells us that the outcomes where both of them are doing the same thing, they're not going to happen. Because if both of them built small or if both of them built large, both of them would have a reason to change their behavior. So those outcomes are not stable. But our solution does involve two Nash equilibria, and we don't know which which of those Nash equilibrium we're going to end up with. So just thinking about this interaction between our two builders as a simultaneous game isn't great in that respect. It's not exactly definitive. What we can do in situations like this, though, is to think, all right, what if we allow one of our players to move first? This will give us what's called a sequential game. We allow one player to move first and then the other player to respond. Now, if we do this, we do have to put our game in what's called extensive form. The game will look like a tree uh, and we just first have to decide who will move first. So let's make a builder number one. We're going to allow builder number one to move first and then builder two to respond to builder one's decision. Now, when we draw our tree, we're just going to start from the left and go from the left to the right. So I'll make a small little dot here. That will be Builder 1 because Builder 1's moving first. This will be uh, the first what we call decision node. From that node, I'm going to put out some branches. The number of branches will correspond to the number of possible actions that Builder 1 can do. So in our example here, 
Builder one can either choose to build a small house or a large house, so there'll be two branches. Now, after builder one has chosen whichever they choose, builder two can make their choice. Now, builder two can respond by either building small or large, so our tree ends up looking like this. I hope it's not too crowded. And I'll just interpret this just in case it's not clear. So builder one can either go small or they could go large. In either case, builder two can respond by going small or large. So we get kind of four possible paths, builder one building small and builder two responding by building small, builder one building small and builder two building large, builder one building large and builder two building small, or builder one build, building large and builder two building large. Now the last thing I have to do is just write out our payoffs. And when we write the payoffs, we're just going to write player one's payoff first and then player two's payoffs. Now I haven't talked about player one and player two here yet. So just really briefly, uh, player one will be the player who moves first. So builder one in this case, and player two will be the player who moves second. So builder two in this case, if we had another agent in this situation who was going to respond to builder number two, they would be player three, uh, etc. cetera. And, and when we write the payoffs in the game, they would be the third payoff. We're just going to find the payoffs from our payoff matrix. And actually here it's really easy because builder one was player one in the simultaneous move game as well. So the order of the payoffs are the same, if that makes sense. So if builder one builds a small house and builder two responds by building a small house, we can see from our matrix that builder one gets five and builder two gets five. So five for player one, five for player two. If Builder 2 responds to Builder 1 building a small house by building a large house, then Builder 2 gets 20 and Builder 1 gets 10. Again, just finding those payoffs from the payoff matrix. If Builder 1 builds large and Builder 2 builds small, then Builder 1 gets 20 and Builder 2 gets 10. If Builder 1 builds large and Builder 2 builds large, then both get 5. Now, so that's our tree. We're going to solve the game by what's called backwards induction. So we created and interpret our extensive form game from left to right, but we actually solve it from right to left. So we start at the end and we move to the beginning. And what we're going to do is we're going to take each decision node and we're going to work backwards. And we're going to think about if I was the player who was deciding at this node, what would be my best response? We're then going to fix their response at that best option for them. And then we can consider earlier decisions by other players. So for instance, let's just take this node here. Imagine we're builder two, and we know that builder one has decided to build a small house. Well, if builder two builds a small house, also they get five. If they build a large house, they get 20. So just remember here, builder two is player two. So we're comparing the second number in our payoffs. Well, 20 is greater than five. So they're going to want to play large. Builder two will want to play large. Now to notate that this is the best option for them here, I'm just going to color in the line red. Let's go to the lower node here, corresponding to the choice that builder two would have to make if builder one played large. So if builder two were here, they could go small and get 10 or large and get five. 10 is greater than five. So that would be their best option uh, to play small. So I'll color in that line. And what we're doing is we're eliminating kind of the non-credible outcomes here, which will help us understand what builder one will do. So for instance, if builder one thought, okay, well, if I go small, builder two could also go small too, and then I'll end up with five. Actually, we know that they're not going to do that. We know from, from our backwards induction that if builder one plays small, then builder two would go large um, in order to get the higher payoff. So we're eliminating all these outcomes that are not going to occur. And then builder one looking forward to their choices about whether to build small or large, they know this too. So then from builder one's perspective, they're weighing up really to build small, in which case they know builder two will build large, they'll get 10 versus building large, in which case they know the builder two will build small. And so they'll end up with 20. Now 20 is bigger than 10. So then we know uh, that builder one will choose to build large and, and they'll, they'll kind of force this optimal outcome for them. And what we found here is what we call a subgame perfect equilibrium. If we trace out the red line, this will tell us the sequence of actions that will take place at the equilibrium. And at the end, we see the outcomes in terms of the payoffs. So builder one will get 20 and builder two gets 10. 
So you can see that as a result of being able to move first, Builder One has really been able to secure the better outcome uh, for them. So just recall when we were playing simultaneously, we weren't sure which Nash equilibrium we would, we would get up to, but as a result of being able to move first, Builder One has been able to secure the better outcome for them. They get 20. Now, if you look at different textbooks, people articulate first mover advantage in kind of different ways. Some talk about market share or some talk about being able to put your competitor in a worse position. I like this definition I have here, just the ability to be able to secure a larger payoff as a result of being able to move first. Now, if you mix the order around, so if you allowed Builder 2 to move first, you should be able to, in this game, uh, see that Builder 2 would be able to secure the better outcome for them. So Builder 1 would build small and Builder 2 would build large. Now, the last thing that I'll say before I finish the video is that when I write out the subgame perfect equilibrium, I'm going to write out the whole strategy. So I'm going to write, well, uh, Builder 1 strategy, which is to play large, semicolon. Now I write Builder 2 strategy, which is play large if Builder 1 plays small or play small if Builder 1 plays large. And I'm writing out the whole strategy here because the status of subgame perfect equilibrium applies to the strategy profile. So it doesn't apply just to the outcome or just to the specific actions that lead to that outcome. It's a property of um, the strategy profile of both players. So we need to, to write down everyone's whole strategy. Your course might not do this or they might not be so strict, but that's how I've learned uh, to do it the proper way. So I think that's it. I hope that that helped. It's just a little example because you guys were asking for it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys are doing really well with your studies. Thanks for all the comments and everything. It's nice to uh, hear from you guys. Uh, have a great day.